There's no notion of the sublime in our work. What's more important is the critical argument behind what we're talking about. No matter how much we delve into the mechanics and the morality of photography, and no matter how much we try to kind of deconstruct the image, I think there's still a part of us that believes in photography and believes in the kind of magic of it. And there's a kind of childish wonder about a photograph when it gets taken and then you look at it. Okay, look into there and super still, huh? Hold it, hold it. There's this romantic notion of the photographer with this perfect sense of timing and the perfect eye and sense of framing. I think it's a lonely process. I've never felt that because I've always had Ollie kind of next to me. The fact that two of us do it has always been problematic for the photographic community, but I think it's kind of liberated us in terms of how we've produced work and how we approach each subject. It's never been enough to pick up a camera and point it in a direction and take a picture. And in a way, neither of us own the pictures we take. Largely, we've forgotten who actually pressed the shutter. There's never kind of one person's signature not in style or thought or concept. Out of the strange kind of dance, um, the work emerges and it's kind of a mystery. I don't know where it actually comes from. It comes from somewhere anonymous. A lot of people described the wars in Afghanistan and Iraq as image wars. And they described 9-11 as an image wound sustained by America and the subsequent wars as actual pursuits of images to reply to that super iconic image. So time and time again, Bush was looking for these iconic images. The toppling of Saddam's statue, the so-called leaked images of his execution, the announcement of victory on the boat, and time and time again, he fucked it up. And you look at how Obama's dealt with it in a much more subtle way. I mean, during uh, Operation Neptune, the assassination of uh, Osama bin Laden, you know, the one image that was allowed out was the circle of very concerned, very serious group of people watching something. And it was the kind of inverse of that iconic image, but it was as choreographed. And it's functioned incredibly well to, to give this kind of benign, very clean image of, of, of the so-called war on terror. And in fact, you have to sign a form saying you can't photograph any wounded soldiers, dead soldiers, any evidence of enemy fire, I mean, any evidence of war, essentially. We were on the front line of the war in Afghanistan with the British Army, and you realize that your role there is unclear, and sometimes you're seen as a documentarian, other times you're there to take confession. We were wondering how can we somehow be subversive in this relationship. Um, and so we, we took a camera and we took photographs. Um, and at the end of each day, the, um, arm, the, the army would check through our pictures and they would delete ones that they didn't like. Then after that process, we just deleted all our pictures. Because we, we realized that you know, the, the, the British army was essentially lifting up our camera and, and, and focusing it and composing the image and taking it on our behalf. And the only way to really resist that was to, to not make an image. Bertolt Brecht spoke about photographs as a kind of hieroglyphics that needed to be decoded and demystified and explained. His solution was to write a little poem for each image that would somehow shine a light on the meaning of the image. What was remarkable was how prescient his words were and how we were able to kind of create connections between his poems and contemporary images of the war on terror. We took his book and where it says Bertolt Brecht, we screen printed over it our own names. And where it said the title of the book, which was War Primer, we screen printed a big two as a kind of sequel. Whereas Brecht looked at World War II, we took the parameters of our analysis as the so-called War on Terror, beginning with 9-11 and ending with the assassination of bin Laden. If Brecht had been operating today, he would be on the internet looking at YouTube videos. So all of the images in War Primer 2 were screen grabs from video. 
the last image in the war primer. We've actually just put a red square. It's there to stand in for an image that we know exists, but we've never seen it. And it's the photograph taken during the assassination of Osama bin Laden. And we know what this picture looks like. Soldiers that were on Operation Neptune have described how when they had his body lying on the ground, they needed to identify him. And it was known that he was six foot four inches tall. He was a really tall man. And uh, they wanted to measure him and make sure that it was the right guy. Um, but nobody had brought a tape measure. So one of the um, soldiers who was exactly six foot two lay down next to the body and they took this photograph. And that photograph exists, but we're never going to see it. It was a very shrewd move on the part of the Obama administration to withhold that image. I'm sure that image will one day kind of leak out because images are quite hard to control, you know, and they get read in different ways and it's very, very hard to keep them kind of boxed in. So hopefully one day we can paste over that red square. The truth is, is that we're not that interested in photography. You know, we're more interested in, in, in the world than in the art world. The end photograph has always felt so kind of pathetic in relation to the experience of making it. We were invited into Arafat's compound to take a, a kind of official portrait of him, and it was just weeks before he died. The security, knowing where we had been, um, kind of uh, x-rayed our 5x4 film 30 to 40 times trying to actually damage the film and when we got back this rather lousy image of Arafat did have a band of yellow running through it which was the x-ray damage. At first we were dismayed that they had managed to damage it and we only quite soon after realized that the damage was much more interesting than the actual image. It opened up a universe to us because until then we had thought of photography in terms of a kind of sealed moment. I mean, it's 125th of a second. It's sealed, it's bound, that's what it is. And suddenly the life expectancy and the way this kind of photograph could communicate opened up. And in fact, the Israeli Defense Force managed to kind of write onto this image. It runs counter to the kind of mythology of the photographer as capturing the perfect essence inside this kind of little rectangular frame. And the accident we embrace rather than, than try and control it. One of the enduring kind of themes of our practice is, is in a way what, what, what's not visible. And, and that's a strange thing when you're talking about photography, but I think we're less interested in what's in the frame and more interested in what's happening outside of the frame. We encountered a remarkable archive of kind of thousands of um, contact strips made by non-professional photographers who were documenting the troubles in Northern Ireland. We noticed that a lot of the images had been obscured and crossed out and some had even been cut out. This archive had been open to the public and people were quite paranoid about being photographed. People were allowed to come in and look at the archive and actually remove themselves. It was a very symbolic act because actually the negatives were still there. We started just thinking how much information does there need to be in a photograph for it to constitute a piece of evidence. Very often what these archivists used was a circular sticker to make a selection. We realized that the minute that that image had been selected, the minute that that sticker had gone down onto the contact sheet, the little area underneath it had been obscured and censored in an unconscious way. And we spent a few weeks going back into the archive and finding the negatives and trying to print that little area under the sticker. As mundane as it sounds, that little area of that tiny image had been hidden for 30 years. The result is a kind of framing that is not under our control. This 35 mil kind of proportioned rectangle has come to mean some kind of truth, but in fact, everything else outside of that is ignored and that's what we're really interested in. We learnt about photography not by taking pictures, but by looking at them um, and looking at the way they intersected with words. Often words are used as a kind of prop to somehow um, contextualize an image. And I think that's one of the themes that emerges in our book, The Holy Bible. We've always been really preoccupied with the relationship between photography and violence and human suffering. 
And why is it that violent images are somehow more repellent than violent words? If you sit down and actually read the text, you see that God emerges through violence and through catastrophe, and that's his mode of speaking. God chooses his people, he then lays down a series of laws, and then if you break the laws, there are a series of punishments. And the state functions much in the same way. So you see the emergence of modern governance, in a sense. We've placed the picture on the page and then we've underlined certain elements of the text. The intention is that the text somehow alludes to a way of reading the image. People say, God, that these images are really difficult to look at. I don't know if you've tried reading the Bible, but some of those passages are really difficult to get through because they're so hideously violent. It reinvigorated, at least for me, a book that I grew up reading every day. My king, my holy hill, my son. But I thought it was dormant for me. I thought it had no meaning. It was kind of amazing to re-explore that relationship as an adult as opposed to just a child who's been given this as kind of propaganda in a way. My soul, my darling, my brethren, my praise. We were drawn to a phrase and it came to pass. It alludes to something quite magical. And we wanted to find one thing, one way of kind of illustrating that phrase. And we found one collection, which was magic tricks. We loved those images and they felt like the kind of antidote to the extreme violence that we were also selecting. When you make a book, you're composing something that has a pace. It's kind of musical, it's a score. And I think it needed that. It needed that kind of lightness in between. So it's kind of lulls you into something and then suddenly jolts you out of it. So it's almost to make you aware that you're looking at a choreographed image that images are all fiction, even if they're showing a dead child or a wounded body or it's a magic more, yeah, trick. It's they're the, all the same, the fictional It's to alert construct. you to the danger of, of, of an image and, and, and the risk of being kind of seduced by it. The source of all the images in the Bible called the Archive of Modern Conflict. They have spent better part of 30 years compiling just a remarkable warehouse of images around the kind of untold, unofficial version of conflict. For instance, they have the largest collection of Nazi soldiers' private photo albums in which you see very intimate moments between young men kissing their wives goodbye, kissing their children goodbye or they would have a dinner party in a ghetto in Poland moments before everybody was shipped off to Auschwitz. It's kind of the history that we're not allowed to think about, or we've never been told. And no Jewish archive wanted to buy this work because it just didn't fit into a narrative that, that we all need to kind of believe in. The Bible is kind of like common property. Everybody feels that they sort of own a piece of it. We expected much more of an uproar, and there's been surprisingly little. Maybe it just, nobody's you know, nobody's yeah. been burning it. It hasn't got to the Midwest yet. Maybe let's see what happens after the surprise, right? I mean, don't know. Don't give our address away. One of the things that we both feel compelled to do is to talk about what we do, and and that's kind of a part of our practice, like talking about it. Maybe we talk too much about it. It kind of takes the mystery out of the work, and I hope there is a little bit of mystery, that it's not so kind of, you know, resolved and clear and neat, because there's something disturbing about projects like that. I think mm. we say too much, yeah. and I think if we could redo a lot of those interviews that we've done, I would just say less. <laughs>